Hi guys, Chu here from Pro Drones. This video is on the Phantom 4 RTK. It was launched four years ago, so we are trying to take a look at how the thing has changed. Just a quick overview of the new features that has been released since, and a few tips to try to manage your workflow a little better now with the new features. So we're going to go through uh, what the original features were, some setup and hardware run through. Then we're going to look at what's new. And with the new features, there are some new mapping methods. So we're going to take a look at those. And one key thing that I used to get a lot of questions about is how do you switch the modes for the DRTK2? So we're going to do a quick video on how to do that and how to use the DRTK2 as a rover. So first, a view on the P4RTK's features. So it has quite a few key features, especially at the time of launch. It had a RTK system, so it gave you a centimeter level positioning system. It had what at the time was OcuSync 1. It was a different low latency communication system, which also allowed more than one drone or object to be linked to a remote. So that's how you can get the DRTK2 linked to the remote and the remote is linked to the drone as well. It also allows you to link more than one drone to the remote at the time. You have a precise imaging system. So it's a combination of some calibration and characteristics of the camera. You have time sync, which we'll go review later. It has to do with the synchronization of the picture snapping time with the GPS time. DRTK2 mobile station compatibility was a new thing at the time. So the DRTK2 was launched just initially to work with the Phantom 4 RTK. So with it also came N-Trip compatibility. So you could actually link to existing correction network and mobile SDK support. So there is actually the Phantom 4 RTK SDK remote. It looks like a normal Phantom 4 Pro V2 remote, but it allows you to connect to quite a few other things. For example, you could then use an iPad and run GS Pro or DJI Pilot to control it. Or if you wanted to, you could write your own custom app. So in these few years, several software such as UGCS already allow you to connect to end trip correction stations and use UGCS to control the drone. It had at the time of launch, the same flight time as the Phantom 4 Pro, the approximately 30 minutes time, the OcuSync 1 video transmission system, which gave you 4.3 miles communication best case. With the RTK, it also gave you one centimeter precise positioning horizontally, vertically 1.5 centimeters. And the initial tests at the time gave you five centimeter absolute horizontal accuracy built in at 100 meter height. The remote also came with the built-in display like a Phantom 4 Pro Plus remote, uh, but this one used a WB37 battery, so you could keep running it non-stop and you had support for 4G modem. With the RTK system, you get not only your centimeter accurate measurement of position, but you also could position the drone accurately. So the RTK module has its own uh, unique points. You can in real time do correction for where your location is and then store it with every image. It would store in the EXIF data of every image. You could also store the Renex data, so then you can use this for PPK processing. It also allows you to use the RTK system to position the drone accurately, and the correction data could come from any source, the RTK2 mobile station, N-Trip correction network, or a custom RTK station. So if you had a Trimble or any other system, uh, recently people have been using the MLIT system to work with it. It works okay, right? So you could use these different systems to provide correction data. OcuSync 1 at the time gave much better video clarity, resilience to interference, as well as switch between bandwidth, signal strength, so you could actually get greater range on the system. The camera was the good old camera that you came with the Phantom 4 Pro with a few additions. So it still had the 1 inch CMOS sensor, 20 megapixel resolution, and the mechanical shutter. But what came extra was the calibration. So the camera lens is pre-calibrated in the factory, and this calibration data is stored in the firmware of the camera. So every image will be then tagged with this calibration data so that the processing software, let's say you load it into Agisoft, it would then have a initial point to start with, which would be close to the accurate number and would not have to have so much variation. The camera is also synchronized with the RTK module. So when every image was captured, you would have a millisecond precise record of time. But usually it's GPS time. So you have a millisecond precise recording of time for you to do post-processing. What will also happen is the camera would also record not only the time, but also because the antenna is at the top of the drone, the camera is at the bottom. So depending on the roll and pitch of the drone, your camera position would actually deviate by a few centimeters whenever the picture is taken, depending on the roll and pitch. So this actual deviation in centimeters is recorded into the same file where the time stamping is done. So you could actually come with a very, very, very precise positioning when you do post-processing. So again, the time sync allows you to synchronize the flight controller, the RTK module, and you will get all your precise timing so that you could get your positioning very accurate. So let's take a look at how the setups options were. There were four typical setups. We're going to go through them one by one. So the first is to connect the aircraft to a network RTK source. So that will be your core station. So what you will be able to do is you just bring the drone, bring the remote, 
ensure you've got a 4G modem uh, stuck in the USB port. Make sure that your worksite has a 4G connection and you will need a Cause account. So what you will do is just link the drone to the Cause account and you will get RTK correction already. So you didn't need any base station or anything like that. You could directly work with your Cause network and you would have RTK precise data to work straight out back. Now the nice part about working like this is your images are immediately geotagged with the RTK position. So that would actually make your workload easier once you're going to do processing because you don't need to re-tag the images. On the downside, you will need first of all an RTK or cost account. Some countries will free, some countries you have to pay for it. But most critically is you will need some form of 4G or Wi-Fi connection. Now, uh, if you're in some places where the connection is bad, you could be waiting for 15 minutes on the ground and you still wouldn't have RTK fixed. So that would be a very common problem with this method. The other solution was to connect the Phantom 4 RTK and remote control to the DRTK2 base station. So this could work anywhere. As long as you were within line of sight, about two kilometers to the DRTK2 base station, you would have your RTK precision data immediately. What it would lack was you would have to be able to measure the known point which you place the DRTK2 base station. Otherwise, your images would be accurate, relatively accurate to each other, but in absolute positioning, it would be off. The third would be to connect the Phantom 4 RTK and the remote control to a third party base station. So uh, this would also be through some kind of a 4G network. What will happen is you would get this data, let's say if you had a third party system and you place it on a known point and you would have some kind of server network to broadcast this correction data out, then your remote control will link to this system. So first of all, you would need 4G or Wi-Fi. You would maybe need an M-trip count. You would have to set the position of the base station so you would have to be accurately placed onto a known point. And as well, you need some kind of custom setup which wouldn't be feasible to everyone. The fourth would be to have everything stored so you have just fly without RTK correction, store everything. You would need a third party base station or the DRTK2 to, to connect the Renex data and then bring everything back and do post-processing. So it's a very complex workflow. You would have to sync your DRTK2 or third party base station data and then work out where its position was and then feed that back into the processing together with the Renex data from the drone and then you would get a precise position of everything. It's quite a complex workflow, but it's relatively reliable because usually these things, it's the same process as if you work with the base station. But having said that, there are cases where, you know, you fly and then you go back and you realize, oops, um, data is wrong. So yeah, that was one of the down points of this method. Now let's take a look at the aircraft. It looks very similar to Phantom 4 Pro. The same prop, light battery, position of everything, including the sensors and imaging. But if you look at the top, you would have the onboard DRTK antenna. So that's where one of the differences was. Now the remote looked a bit more funky. It shares this remote with the Agra system, so it has the dust seals and everything. And occasionally, you would find the Agra's logo somewhere on the remote. So at the bottom, you have a USB-C port with the rubber cover. That one, uh, you would use it for firmware updates, some data transfer. Uh, next to it is a 3.5mm audio jack. We're not sure why it's there. Um, maybe for you to listen to music while you're flying. Uh, you would have a micro SD card slot on the right-hand side. That is where you would actually feed uh, KML data, elevation data. So you can actually do terrain follow now. As well as if you use the DRTK2 as a rover, you can actually export that data through the micro SD slot. At the back, you would have your battery hatch for the WB37 battery. That is hot swappable. There's a standby battery built into the remote. And at the bottom, you would have a hatch for your 4G slot. So if you're familiar with the system, it's just that the hardware hasn't changed at all. Apart from a minor part where it used to be 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz. Now, uh, depending on region, it's either 2.4 or 5.8 gigahertz. Uh, we're not sure why that's done, but uh, yeah, uh, DJI has made that change through one of the firmware updates. So we'll look at what else has changed in terms of the firmware and functionality. Now at this point, the date of the firmware is uh, July 2020. You can see the firmware versions. Now this is unique uh, in terms of uh, DJI products. Because if you look here, since October 2018, they've been gradually adding functions. And this is, if you've used DJI products, it's not that common where they've added actually a lot of functions and the functionality of this set actually has increased quite a bit. So they've added two different 3D mapping modes, in fact, KML file support, linear flight mode for your corridor mapping, uh, terrain awareness flight. So you just load your elevation data inside and you can follow the terrain. So if you set 100 meter height above ground, you will maintain 100 meter height above your terrain data. Altitude optimization is a method where you would use a 2D mapping, but it would then add some images to correct for the elevation error that you typically get. Key feature would be having the DRTK2 as a rover. That was very significant because it uh, reduced the amount of tools that you had to carry out into the field. It also allowed you to access the raw data, which is the raw satellite data that would be stored in the bin files, which is stored in the DRTK2. So you just plug it into your PC and you can access it like a USB drive. 
Uh, they provided Cloud PPK. We haven't tested that in a while, so we're not too sure about that functionality. Linear Flight not only have a corridor map, but also a corridor map with a changing elevation. So you can actually change it from a mild slope all the way to a vertical facade if you want to check. The same with Angle Flight Road, so you can actually map, let's say, a hill slope or a facade straight up. So it's got so many functions to the point that even the view of the map options is different. Uh, so you can see block segmentation, walk with RTK. So what with RTK is when you use the DRTK2 as a rover. Block segmentation is where you can actually chop the jobs up so you can uh, use multiple drones to uh, map a larger area. Right? And the rest will take a look at it uh, in the following slides. So 3D mapping mode is basically they set the camera at 45 degrees or whatever oblique angle you want and then fly in a crisscross uh, method. So this would double the flight time over a particular area. It would increase the number of pictures, so it would require more processing time. But what you would have is more accurate uh, terrain information. Linear flight mode, like I mentioned, is for mapping for roads, rivers, power line corridors. So you could actually just fly along a long line instead of having to map in small squares along a path. What you could also do is set, let's say, have a 50 kilometer corridor, but then limit it to blocks of, let's say, 400 meters. So it would then chop the jobs into 400 meter chunks. So you could actually move along this corridor uh, to work efficiently. Altitude optimization is a kind of middle ground solution. You would still have the efficiency of 2D mapping. You will still get some 3D data. So it would then end with a small amount of oblique images. So what will happen is once you've done your flight, your 2D mapping over your area, you would then from the end point, tilt the camera at an oblique angle and fly towards the center of the work area, area interest, and then capture images along the way. So this would then offset for the altitude uh, inaccuracies. 3D mapping multi-oriented is new. This one uh, is also now available in the other models, but this is the first model to have this mode. So what you do in this mode is that first it will fly one nadir operation and four oblique operations facing the different facades of the object. So let's say if you have a building, uh, first it would take one nadir mission, that means the camera 90 degrees down. After that, it would then capture the north, south, east, west facing sides of the building. And this will give you the most amount of look angles, the most amount of details so that you can then process your 3D objects with better resolution and detail. I've done a comparison, we'll review that later. So uh, yeah, but that this takes the most amount of time to, to do mapping. So note that in the four uh, north, south, east, west flight paths, the drone doesn't change its orientation. It keeps looking, flying, facing the same direction. So block segmentation allows you to divide a very large complex mission into smaller missions. So as you can see here, we have divided this large area into four chunks. So you can have potentially four drones flying in four different directions to get your data, which cuts down manpower quite a bit and speeds up your work. Uh, terrain awareness flight. So if you can see the different colors here and there's a scale on the left. So the different colors represent different elevation levels. And you can see in the altitude uh, chart below, lines waving up and down, up and down. So that is the flight path adjusting to the different elevation change of the area. The DRTK2 is a rover, so you can then um, use it to measure points. So as you can see, you can measure your long lead height with the error noted. So you don't have to carry a second base station around, let's say your typical GNSS mapping module and the DRTK2 and the drone when you go out to work. Of course, the support for KML files means you could then take a KML file, pre-draw it in your GIS software or Google Maps, export the area type to do your mapping. So this helps especially when you have complex boundaries of area. You don't need to drag and click and drag out that much in your remote. It also reduces the chance of you missing somewhere for you to map. Now, with all the new different methods, you'll be wondering, you know, what is good, what is bad, which should I use for a particular type of job? So I've done a simple comparison. I just uh, simply chose an area in front of our office. This is an 11.3 hectare size area. All of them are flown at the same 100 meter height. I used the four modes, the 2D flight mode, 2D flight mode with altitude optimization, 3D flight mode and 3D multi-oriented flight mode. The control points are the same and the DRTK2 is placed on the same position every single time. So this is the area with satellite image. You can see PT are the points. So PT1 is my control point, which I placed the DRTK2 base station. 2 until 10 are those that I actually went to measure on the ground. So you can see the point, long lead, altitude with the standard deviations. So all of them are within 2 to 3 centimeter errors. So this is the 2D flight mode. 
as you can see the yellow line is just very simply start at the green point fly left to right right to left left to right right to left until the end point this is with flight altitude optimization so as you can see at the end there is this diagonal line coming into the center that one is flown with the camera at, at an oblique angle capturing images this is the 3d mapping method which is the camera is oblique all the way and it flies in a crisscross pattern so this one is the five viewpoint method you can see flight path one which is the nadir looking one and the oblique ones look like this. Three, four, five. So all of them produce a similar output like this. The details is actually once we correlate back with all the known points, we can see the difference. So here's where the differences are. For 2D mapping, I took a total of 250 images. It took 9 minutes and 50 seconds. The XY error is not too bad. It's also within the stated 5 centimeter absolute. But the Z error was significant. So that is 6.3 meters off. Right? So the improvement over 2D mapping with the altitude optimization, it took an extra 17 images. Flew a little bit longer, but as you can see, the total error dropped back down to about 6 centimeters. If you look at the 3D mapping method, you took 773 images. So it's about more than 3 times the 3D mapping. It flew for 26 minutes and 31 seconds. So it's about almost 2.5 times as long. And the error is still pretty small, it's about 8 to 9 centimeters. So you actually still get a pretty good error rate. 3D mapping multi-oriented is the one with the largest amount of images. So 1,431 images. It took more than one hour to fly the thing. And we still got an error of roughly about 6 centimeters. So if you would have to do uh, your normal, uh, very quick mapping with some elevation data, and the ele elevation isn't very complex, you can use the 2D mapping with altitude optimization. It'll get the job done very well. If you're doing some kind of uh, building or very complex facade inspection, yeah, you can use the 3D mapping multi-oriented. You will get a lot of look angles and images to process it. So we're going to take a look at how to switch the modes for the DRTK2. The reason is because originally the DRTK2 came in only three modes, mode 1, 2 and 3. They added the mode 4 and 5, so they finally decided to integrate all the different models and functions of the DRTK2 into one standardized firmware. So previously, you would actually have uh, one version of the DRTK2 which is for matrix only. It would say matrix only on the side and that you couldn't update the firmware using the p4r you couldn't link it with the p4r uh, so it became quite a troublesome thing now they've unified the firmware so not only does it work with the p4r p4m and the m210 rtk it also works with the m300 the agras models so you can use this one base station for a lot of other work so we're going to have a quick look at how to do this Right, so if you can see the remote now, it's in mode 3. The green LED is blinking 3 times. So we're going to have to work out how to switch the mode. Now you can see the M button. So that is the mode switch button. So to switch the mode, you're going to have to press and hold the M button until the green blinking LED turns yellow. Then you release. So once it starts blinking in yellow 3 times, means you can switch, it's in mode 3 now. If you press the button once and release, it will then increment by 1. So you will blink 4 times, 5 times, then back to 1 time. So you can switch mode 5, you know, from 3 to 4 to 5, 1, 2, again. See? So now it's blinking once, so it's back to mode 1. And if you leave it for a while, it will then reset itself and then enter mode 1 and then start blinking uh, green once. So as you can see now, it's blinking green once. It's now in mode 1. So if I press and hold again, it'll blink uh, yellow once. See now it's mode 2. If I press again, it'll blink yellow 3 times. And if I leave it, it will then after reset after a few uh, blink sequences and then uh, go into mode 3. Okay, so now we know how to turn it from mode 1 to mode 3 and back again. So what does it do in mode 3? So mode 3 allows you to use the DRTK2 as a rover. So generally what you have to do is to first have a, make sure you have a 4G SIM card in the modem, plug it into the remote and make sure you have a course network subscription. Turn on the DRTK2, switch it to mode 3 and then link the remote to the DRTK2. Then in the main menu, select plan, walk with handheld RTK. And then you just start placing it, wait for the accuracy to come down and then just press C2 or tap on the screen to start logging positions. 
So once everything is done, you save the project and then when you want to retrieve the data, you export it to the SD card and then you can use it on the PC. I now have the, the RTK2 as a handheld stick. So as you can see, it's linked as a handheld stick. You can see the firmware version and the battery level. So once you tap on plan, you come with this menu. Tap on walk with RTK, you come to this menu. Now as you can see at the top, it says signal. So there's no uh, RTK fix yet. So you can see the accuracy is 177.6 centimeters. So all you have to do is set your custom network RTK, your Ntrip host port, and wait. So once you're connected, you wait a while, you then wait for it, you signal, float, then fix. Once fixed, you will see the accuracy drop to centimeter level. The accuracy depends on how far you are from the course station. Now, once you want to set a point, you tap on set point. It will then ask you to whether you want to just record the current coordinate or have a five coordinate average. Typically, I work with the five average. It averages out back to one second, so it's better, I guess. And then once you place it on a point, you either tap on a screen, the C2 point setting, or press the C2 button at the back. This menu will then pop up. You can change your point prefix number. Instead of PT, you can call it DOT or whatever you want. Device altitude is the face center distance from the tip of the rod. So the unit measures the position where the antenna is. And the antenna is 1.8011 meters from the tip of the rod at the bottom. So that is the offset amount. And then you can also put a label. You can label like for instance, point 0.1 actually means drain hole cover or something like that. So you can actually put that down there. Once you've keyed that in, tap save, it will then save somewhere. Your save point will turn up as a purple dot. So if you move to your next point, hit C2 again, key in your next point, then you have two purple dots. So you keep on carrying so, so fast. Once you're done, tap save. It will then ask you to key in the task information. So give it a name and then you'll save all of this data into, like for instance, I put rover demo, you'll save as rover demo. So once you're done and you go back to the office, you want to extract the data, you would then turn on the remote, go into the SD card menu, and one of the options you can do is to export the DRTK task. So once you tap on the rover demo or whichever task you want to export, click export, and then if it's successful, you save in the slash DJI slash export slash RTK scout folder. It's saved as a CSV, so you can just open using Excel. It'll look something like this. So with this ellipsoid data, not geoid data, so you'll have to do some geoid correction. But as far as getting data in is concerned, it's still a very simple way. So which means you only need to carry your DRTK2 and the drone and the remote and your batteries. So you don't need to carry your own base station to do any other conversion. So in conclusion, as far as equipment is concerned, it still gives very good accuracy. As you can see, I still get six centimeters with no correction for an 11 hectare area, which I can cover in within 10 minutes. It is very rapid work, right? So you're going to cover large areas very quickly, especially if you're looking for very specific points or you're just looking for grid spot height and things like that over cleared land. This is your tool. It's still relatively cheap uh, compared to other solutions, especially solutions which are as integrated as this. No third party tools and things like that. You just buy, pump in your cart, put in the batteries, go. It's actually relatively cheap considering the value which it brings. The nice part is if you already have a Phantom 4 Pro, so you can just take the batteries and just plug it in. It will still fly. It will still use it. Um, no issue. The batteries are still available and we still feel they're quite reasonably priced. Just a bit of reference. It's half the price of a piece of M300 battery. So it's still relatively cheap for the flight time that you get. The camera is still sharp. It's got all the functionality built in. It's got a mechanical shutter with no rolling shutter distortion. So it's one of the few that way short of strapping an SLR on the thing, you're not going to get that much better. Like I said, it has a lot of functions built in. It has custom functions to do corridor mapping, 2D or 3D buildings, you know, oblique views, the splitting of the jobs into, you can do multiple drone control with one remote. So there's still a lot of functions that's packed into actually what is relatively a small package. And finally, having the DRTK2 as a rover, it increases the versatility. So you can actually start carrying it around, measuring known points before you start work. You don't have to carry that many pieces of equipment with you. And if you don't want to, you, the DRTK2 with its raw data, what you can do is uh, if you have no connection, place it over, let's say, nail heads or anywhere you want to use as a known point. Put it in there for 15 minutes, 20 minutes for observation time. And then uh, bring it back, take out the raw data. You can do PPK and you can still continue work the next day. So what you'll do is you take the data, take the course data, do your PPK. And then after that, when you go back to the same site, put the DRTK2 back in the same posi position. Then key in your coordinates for the known position and you're ready to go. Everything is RTK accurate. So this 
added functionality of the DRTK2 really helps a lot. As usual, thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, email us. You'll find the email address at the bottom in the description of the video. Subscribe and like if you want more videos like this. As always, fly safe.